Welcome back to another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown. Uh, today, we are shining a community spotlight on one of the great organizations here in the city of Calgary. And today's organization is Heritage Calgary. Now, I'm relatively new to the city of Calgary. I came here in 2020, at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020. So I'm looking forward to learning about these great organizations that we have in this community. And today we have the executive director, uh, chief executive officer, sorry, the chief executive officer, uh, Josh Traptow. Uh, Josh, thank you so much for doing this. This is an honor and a pleasure. And I'm pretty sure I just butchered your last name, didn't I? You did trap toe, but that's okay. It, uh, <laughs> it, it, it does happen that uh, that TOW uh, really throws people off and they really want to say trap toe. It's not the first time, won't be the last time. Um, Josh, I, 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 let's start with the age old question Who is Heritage Calgary or what is Heritage Calgary? Let's start there. Heritage Calgary is a civic partner of the city of Calgary. Um, we have a, a mandate to advise uh, mayor and council on, on all heritage related matters. Uh, and uh, we also maintain the inventory of evaluated historic resources. And Heritage Calgary has existed uh, since uh, 2000 and there was precursor heritage organizations prior to that. Calgary uh, in general has had kind of a heritage group of one form or another since the 1970s. Um, and uh, we were previously known as the Calgary Heritage Authority and then uh, changed our name in uh, fall of 2019 to Heritage Calgary. And uh, that's, uh, that's uh, what we're currently known as. And uh, our vision is a city that understands and values its diverse heritage. And our mission is to embrace and keep space for the stories of this place. And how does one do that? We are a ever-growing, ever-expanding city. How does one keep its heritage while preserving the past, but also looking towards the future? And how does Heritage Calgary play into that uh, sort of mission? Yeah, so one of our cornerstone pieces of our mandate is to maintain the inventory of evaluated historic resources. And most cities will have a heritage registry or a heritage inventory, and they're really the same thing. They're, they're, they're kind of a list of sites that are historically significant. And in the city of Calgary, there's over 800 sites that are listed our, on our inventory. And that's both built heritage uh, and non-built heritage, like par uh, parks, archeological sites, uh, and the like. Uh, you know, places like Bonas Park, Nose Hill Park, Confederation Park are all listed on the heritage inventory. But so are sites like the uh, Pascapu Archaeological Site or the 12 Mile Cooley Archaeological Site, uh, as well as some other, other archaeological sites that are not available publicly, just, you know, kind of due to not having people go to dig in, in those kind of sites and, and that sort of thing. But it's all about really telling the stories uh, of those sites. Uh, you know, the people that live there, the people that worked there, uh, you know, sites that are significant, um, you know, like Fort Calgary, you know, the, the, the traditional gathering place of Indigenous peoples for, for millennia. And then, of course, you know, the place where Calgary was settled at the Elbow um, and, and the Bow River and, and Mokinstis, um, you know, as the traditional Blackfoot, Blackfoot name uh, of Calgary. And so we do that through the inventory, but also through programs like the Historian in Residence, which is a partnership that we have with the Calgary Public Library, or through our blog, uh, whether it's blogs that have been written by Heritage Calgary or guest blogs uh, to, tell, to tell the stories of Calgary. And one focus that Heritage Calgary has really been making since we changed our name is to really make sure that the stories that are being told are, are of all Calgarians, whether they're new, old, uh, whatever it might be, uh, making sure that all those stories are able to be told and that everyone feels like, uh, you know, their history belongs uh, to Calgary. Um, you are great at setting up so many different questions and uh, I guess the first one I want to start with, and this is uh, uh, something along the lines of uh, being on the Blackfoot uh, Confederacy here uh, in Calgary, there has been a big uh, movement to preserve our heritage when it comes to our First Nations and Aboriginal communities here in Calgary, but also across Canada and around the world. How does Heritage Calgary work in conjunction with our First Nation partners that make up this great province and this great country? 
that's something that we've been working on as an organization. Our, our first kind of relationship building with that is through a current project we're undertaking around naming, renaming, and, and commemoration of the city of Calgary. Um, some of your listeners may recall back in July of 2020, uh, there was a notice of motion at council to look at uh, removing uh, the name of James Short from the Park and Parkade located in Chinatown. And that kind of then um, spurred a, a larger conversation at the city uh, around how do you rename something? You know, what are the thresholds for renaming? And of course, we saw that with the um, the uh, the uh, Bridgeland uh, School, formerly Langevin School, um, that was renamed by the CBE late last year. And then we saw uh, Bishop Grandin uh, renamed, I think, to Haysboro Community High School or something along those lines by the Calgary Catholic School District. So there are already examples of renaming in Calgary, but we wanted to make sure that every group in Calgary, groups in Calgary, uh, are being consulted on that. And so we've been working with uh, an Indigenous elders um, knowledge circle for this project with representatives made up from the, uh, the Blackfoot, the Stony Nakoda, the uh, Sutina, and the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. And so those four elders have really been giving us good insights um, into the traditional uh, names uh, for places, but also, you know, how naming and commemoration is important to, to Indigenous peoples. And, you know, we've been working and, and will continue to work with the Indigenous Relations Office of the City of Calgary. Um, we worked quite closely with the city through uh, then Mayor Nenshi's office, the Calgary Aboriginal Urban Affairs Committee on the text for the Reconciliation Bridge plaque. Um, when that bridge was renamed from Langevin to Reconciliation, we wanted to make sure that there was context as to why that name was changed and why it was important to change that name and why Reconciliation was chosen. And so working closely with um, the city, uh, CAWAC, the Calgary Abor Aboriginal Armed Affairs Committee, to make sure that, you know, the story of who Langevin was, the impact of residential schools, and why reconciliation is important, was reflected on that plaque. Uh, I must say it's probably one of the larger plaques that we've worked on because there was so much information that needed to go there, but it was important that the entire story of the impact of residential schools and the ongoing trauma that Indigenous peoples have from residential schools was reflected on that on that text. We are uh, we are living in a very digital age of 2022 that we are currently in, and there's a lot of things that go on that people believe should be kept in the heritage perspective, and some people who may not agree with that. How does Heritage Calgary make the designation of if something is truly her uh, uh, truly historic and deserves to be preserved against not being preserved because what you might think and what I might think are two different things. And then when you have a city of 1 million people plus as always growing, you have a million different views on this. So how does the Heritage Calgary board or yourself or even working with the conjunction with the city decide which is going to be priority and which is actually going to be designated as a heritage uh, uh, designation? Yeah, and, and, and that's a great question. So in Calgary, we have a very rigorous criteria that we use for the inventory. Uh, this criteria was developed back in the early 2000s, uh, and it was considered, you know, kind of groundbreaking at its time to the point that a lot of municipalities across the country have used Calgary's evaluation system, and it's a merit-based evaluation system. Uh, you know, the, the first criteria we consider is, is a site at least 25 years old? If it is, great. It then kind of goes forward to the next stage. We then start to consider things like, what is it? It's, what is its integrity? Uh, you know, does it still retain original elements from when it was originally constructed? Uh, if so, do we think that it will um, uh, fulfill one of the values that we have? We have nine values. And, and as long as a site has one of those values, it's considered uh, having historical significance. And those values are activity, event, institution, person slash people, style, design, construction, landmark, and symbolic value. So as long as a site is 25 years old, it has integrity, and it hits one of those values, we then add it to the inventory. 
Once a site's on the inventory, it means it's historically significant, but it still means it can be demolished or significantly altered. Just being on the inventory does not give sites legal protection. Uh, the owner of that property then has to take it a further step by uh, applying to the city to be designated as a municipal historic resource. The city then works with that owner to uh, draft a designation bylaw. They will work with the owner to, you know, what elements of that property want to be designated. Um, a lot of times it's just the facade that is regulated. Like there's, you know, kind of this, this myth that if, if a site is considered, uh, if it's designated as heritage, you know, you can't update your bathroom, you can't update your kitchen, you, know, you can't do anything with your site. And, and that's really not the case, uh, especially if it's only the facade that's designated, uh, which is um, the outside for those that, you know, may not be familiar with, with some of the, the heritage jargon. Uh, so, you know, it might be the windows that are designated, the, 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 the wood cladding or the siding, um, you know, some of the fenestrations, which so is it can be that specific. Specific. It can oh, be yes. that specific where, okay, this window, which was 1812 when it was uh, created, this window is technically a, in the inventory now. The rest of the house that's it, that is there. So the entire... Not. No, so the entire house would be on the inventory. Okay. That's what that's what we call a character defining element. So that's where we kind of break down the individual elements of heritage. And that's where we would break down, you know, like the, the front windows are a double hung window, which is, you know, kind of from the original. Uh, you know, depending what architecture style it is, it also has elements, you know, whether it's a Queen Anne revival or a, a, a classical um um, you know, gothical, you know, kind of around churches. So to designate, it, it does get down into the literal, you know, uh, windows, doors, you know, say in the living room, there's some original cabinetry that's built in. Uh, that would also be part of the designation process, but that's only at the intent of the owner. And, and, it's, and it's what they want to be designated. So they would work with the city and say, you know, yeah, I want, you know, the windows to be designated. I want the uh, wood siding to be designated. And then it goes through to council, it, like any other bylaw, it goes through three readings. And then that means that whatever is regulated in that portion of the bylaw uh, cannot be significantly altered uh, or change without the city uh, being, you know, consulted. You know, like you could still update the windows as long as you did a like for like. So as long as, you know, it, 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 it was, you know, um, sympathetic to the period, you use similar materials, you can still make those changes. You just have to do like for like. What are some of the benefits of going through this process? Because I, I'm looking at this right now and I'm looking, okay, 25 years for anyone who's, who's trying to do quick math in their head, which I just had to write down, that's 1997. What would be the benefit of trying to preserve something that was created in 1997? I'd just say that because you said it has to be at least 25 years old, yeah. just giving context. And what would the benefit be for the location, the park, the archaeology uh, archaeology area? What is the benefit of going through this process to have it on that inventory list? So, you know, some of the... I think some of the newest sites are kind of like from the 1980s, like the Olympic Oval, Olympic Plaza, the Calgary Chinese Cultural Center, which is from, uh, I think, 1992, um, which is probably kind of one of the newest sites. Um, so those sites are just on the inventory. They're, they're not designated. Um, the, the benefits that come with designation really boils down to, you know, people that, that want to see, you know, kind of to see that property remain. They don't want to see it demolished. Um, you know, especially if, you know, their street is made up of, of, of other similar homes, uh, designating it would kind of help preserve some of that, you know, look and feel of the neighborhood. Um, in terms of incentives that are available, the, the city has a, um, a, a grant program that's available for residential sites that are designated, and each property is eligible for up to $125,000 per site. Uh, it is a matching grant. But you can use the things for, you know, if you need to upgrade uh, your plumbing or your wiring. So you have, you know, old uh, knob and tube wiring and you need to update the wiring or you need to, you know, put new cedar shakes on the roof because that's considered a character defining element or you need to do, redo some of the windows. Um, so those are the incentives. Most owners that designate it, they're not, they're not doing it for the grant program. They're doing it because they want to preserve that property for their community, for their 
city and, and they just feel that it's the right thing to do. Now, I, I just, I'm going to play devil's advocate here for a second. Because yes. I think we just, I, I want to give context to my listeners and to my viewers. If you go through this process of designating something and putting it into the inventory list, um, you do have that uh, historical designation. Now, if I'm a landowner beside an area that is being designated, does that mean that now I have to take into consideration what I do to my house or do to my property because of the historical designation of something next to me? I, I just want to make sure that my listeners know that this is just for certain people who go through this process and it doesn't affect everyone. Correct. It, 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 it does not affect uh, you know, adjacent properties or anything like that. Um, you know, we, we, we encourage development when development is happening beside heritage properties to consider things like similar materials, you know, say if, if most of the houses on your street are from a certain period and they use wood siding, consider using, you know, uh, wood siding uh, for a new build, you know, perhaps respecting the setbacks. Uh, you know, depending on again when when that property is developed. But no, you know, if, if there was if there was a, a, a house designated, there would be no restrictions on the property beside it, uh, on either side or on the alley or anything like that. It only applies to the property uh, where the designation bylaw is then registered on the land title. So any future owners yeah. would then know. They do their proper due diligence uh, that that property is designated and you know what that means. Uh, and in that designation bylaw, it would spell out you know what are the regulated portions of it, uh, but also know that both Heritage Calgary and Heritage Heritage Planning in the City of Calgary are always happy to chat you know with prospective homeowners if they are looking at buying either a designated property or an inventory property. Uh, you know, because there are those myths about, well, if something's heritage, there's nothing you can do with it. You know, there's also those myths, if something's designated, you can never sell it. Again, untrue. Uh, it, you know, heritage designation doesn't regulate the use of it. So, you know, if you eventually wanted to apply for a rezoning and it was re uh, zoned residential and you wanted to zone it commercial uh, because, you know, that's that's the use you want to use it for, nothing prevents you from, from applying for that rezoning or for different changes of use or anything like that. Now, off the top of your head, if you can, if you can, if you know this number, we, we we're talking about houses here a lot and the potential designation of uh, putting the uh, potential house on the inventory. How often do houses be, go, get in, go onto the inventory list? Is it a rare occurrence or is it more common than one might think? Because when I'm thinking about Heritage Calgary, I'm thinking, like you said, the parks, the Olympic Dome, maybe Calgary Tower, some office buildings downtown. I'm not thinking of, I'm just using my street and I, I feel like I shouldn't, but my house, like, I feel like there's not a lot of people who are going in, hey, I want my house designated, but I could be yeah. wrong. What is the so, numbers? So, so to be on the inventory, um, Heritage Calgary can evaluate any property to put it on the inventory because there's no um, regulation or anything like that. We don't require the owner's consent because being on the inventory does not mean you can still demolish, you can still significantly alter. It's only when you designate. Um, so oftentimes, you know, we'll go through an evaluation. We reach out to the owner at the end of the process and say, hey, your house is now on the inventory. And then we have owners saying, oh my God, this is so cool. I want to take it forward to the next step. I want to designate it. Or the owner says, uh, this is great, but I have no interest in designation. And that's totally fine. Like there's, there, there's no judgment on Heritage Calgary's part. Um, we add anywhere from 40 to 50 sites to the inventory kind of on an annual basis. And we've been seeing that increasing the last couple of years, uh, largely because I think Calgarians are interested in designation. Uh, they're more in tune to what the heritage inventory is, but also more in tune to just what heritage uh, in our city uh, feels like. Um, in 1990, we designated our first uh, site as a municipal heritage resource and it was Historic City Hall. It took us 30 years to uh, 2020 to get to 100 municipally designated sites. And that was St. Mary's Parish Hall CNR station located in uh, Mission Cliff Bungalow uh, beside St. Mary's Cathedral there. Uh, that was our 100th designation. We're now sitting at I think like 120, 105 or 120, 125 designations. So in those two years, we've seen an increase of 10 to 15, 20 designations. 
And we're seeing that number continue to increase because I think there's just more awareness when it comes to, to designation. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. We everyone's at home right now everyone's sitting at home and because of COVID-19 we're doing the socially distance and all that fun stuff people are starting to try to find things to do and one of the things that I, I find interesting is um, looking back I'm a big uh, fan of uh, going back ancestry.com learning about your past do you does Heritage Calgary have resources online that residents of Calgary can go visit and look at to potentially look at potentially starting this process of getting on the inventory and then getting through the uh, the actual designation of their property yeah. or of a location. Yeah, so so the inventory is publicly available to anyone. Um, it's uh, the, our new our new uh, inventory was just launched uh, on January 17th. Uh, so it's a new GIS uh, web-based platform to replace the old inventory, and anyone can go and search uh, on so many different uh, search criteria. You know, the, you know the name of the site, what community is it in, the development era, what architectural style is it, uh, is it provincially designated, is it municipally designated? So you know they can go there, and then we also you know have. Uh, on our blog, you know, the, the how to's of heritage talking about, you know, how to get on the inventory. Once you're on the inventory, you know, how to then approach designation, because we really want to make it as easy as possible for, for Calgarians to find that information. And we're definitely seeing an uptick uh, in people being home, wanting to explore more in their community. Um, we even created some self-guided walking tours. Uh, I think we have about five different self-guided walking tours. And our first one, uh, we were able to put together thanks to the proceeds from Cold Garden when they sold their Kronk uh, back in 2020. They gave a pro uh, portion of the proceeds to Heritage Calgary uh, when they sold uh, Kronk, which was kind of that molasses tasting fermented beverage that I'm not a fan of, but I know a lot of people uh, really enjoyed Kronk. And uh, it was all thanks to uh, local uh, researcher, uh, political scientist, uh, Paul Ferry, who, you know, finds all these little tidbits and kind of found this, this recipe for Kronk. And then Cold Garden said, oh, I think we can make something like that. So we kind of adapted from there going from Inglewood, a walking tour. We have a Bridgeland Riverside. We have a Chinatown. We have a Mission Cliff Bungalow. And those are, you know, kind of do it your own pace. You can start and stop. Uh, but just to get people out, uh, in, 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 in neighborhoods and in, in communities to, to just, you know, learn more uh, about their city. I, I, I do want to talk about the walking tours a little bit more, but I have one last question about the designation and uh, being on the inventory. Now, I'm a very indecisive person. <laughs> I start my process and I'm like, hey, I want to be on that inventory because I believe my areas uh, should be designated as a historical uh, uh, designation. A, w a week from now, I'll go, well, what was I thinking? Can you retract a building or a spot that is on the inventory? Or once it's on, is it always on or always once, in? Once a site's on the inventory, it, it, it's, it's there in perpetuity. Okay. Because again, being on the inventory does not, you know, it doesn't come with any restrictions. But um, being designated, it's Designated not does. Yeah, okay. designated does. And... Um, we, we have not, we've only seen one instance where a site has been designated and has been de-designated. And that was the Eau Claire smokestack back in 2015, 2016, uh, Harvard development, um, was looking at developing that site. It's, uh, the remnants from the old Calgary transit bus barns. So a lot of people, you know, don't necessarily know that Eau Claire was an industrial area, uh, in the early days of Calgary. There was the Eau Claire Lumber Mill, uh, which was uh, it, it, the original um, uh, headquarters, was just recently moved off site. 
to accommodate the re, um, reimagination of Eau Claire Plaza and it will be moved back on site. Uh, but that was an old lumber, lumber mill. And then when it then became the Calgary Transit bus barns. And so the smokestack, I think it dates from the 1950s, is the last remnant of the Calgary Transit bus barns. So it was de-designated in 2016, I think, to accommodate it being moved for development purposes. Uh, that is the only instance in Calgary of a site being de-designated. There's been some instances in Edmonton, but those sites have burned down and there's just, there's nothing left to designate uh, or, or to protect through a designation bylaw. But uh, the idea of designation is that's, that it's in perpetuity. Uh, it's not, you know, you can't be like, ah, oh, you know, three years later, oh, I'm not interested in designation anymore. That's not the idea of designation. The idea of designation is that it's there in perpetuity. Um, and you know the the owner when they're going through that process knows full well uh, you know what's involved in the process and you know they could start the process and then say yeah this isn't for me and you know as long as as long as it is not approved uh, past three readings by council and you know been signed by the mayor you know you're able to stop at any time and then if you want to start back up that's no problem but as soon as as soon as council approves three readings and the mayor has signed that bylaw that property is designated and. Like Does there, it cost money to go through the process? There, there, there's no cost uh, to, to the homeowner. Uh, costs are, are paid for uh, by the city through the designation process. And Heritage Calgary uh, were funded by the city of Calgary. And so we fund uh, all the evaluation, or sorry, all the inventory work. Uh, it's all uh, funded uh, through our budget. So there's no cost to the homeowner. Uh, the only cost would be if they wanted to use that matching grant program uh, where it's a 50-50 matching grant. So, you know, say their project is going to cost 20 grand, they would need to put in 10,000 and the city would then match it uh, up to 10,000 as well for a project up to a maximum of $125,000 per site. Let's jump back to the walking tours for a second. You talked about the five that are currently there. Um, COVID-19 has kind of changed the name of the game and on your website of Heritage Calgary, which will be in the show notes for anyone who's watching this, scroll down and you'll find it or continue watching this until the end and then scroll down and click on it and learn more. Um, but also if you're listening to this, hit back and then you'll find the uh, link to Heritage Calgary's website. The walking tours were guided and then uh, COVID-19 kind of reared its ugly head and you have had to change the name of the game. Are you finding interest of people wanting to go out and tour? I know we're in the middle of the winter, so that's kind of a weird statement to say in the height of a, a winter, but yeah. are you finding people are more interested now in heritage and learning about the history of this great city of ours? Absolutely. I, I think especially in COVID with people, you know, sticking around, uh, not being able to travel, wanting to learn about their community. And that's kind of really quickly why we pivoted to these self-guided walking tours. Um, you know, in the summertime, we would do walks for James Walk, uh, Historic Calgary Week. Like I think our last Historic Calgary Week walk that we did uh, back in 2019. And Historic Calgary Week is always the first week of August ending on the um, August uh, Heritage Day, August long weekend. So it's a week long festival put on by the Chinook Country Historical Society with you know, tons of events, tons of programming. Uh, but we saw 150 people come out for our walking tour on Stephen Avenue, uh, looking at both Stephen Avenue and also go signs. Um, and so we knew that you know, we're not gonna be able to have 150 people come to any of our tours for the time being. So we're like, okay, um, we need to start looking at self-guided walking tours. So, you know, we started with Inglewood and then we created one for Mission, uh, Cliff Bungalow Mission, the Warehouse District, Chinatown, uh, and Kensington as well. Kensington was a new one uh, last fall. So I think in total we have six. Um, you know, we're hoping, depending on what happens with COVID, that we might be able to do some smaller scale guided walking tours kind of in the spring, summertime. But uh, yeah, for the time being, um, you know, folks can go to our website, heritagecalgary.ca, and under programs, they can find all the walking tours. And it's, you know, just a, a PDF guide that, you know, you can uh, open up on your phone and you can start anywhere on the map. And there's a handy map uh, for the guide. And, you know, then it talks about, you know, the, the address of the site, when it was built, uh, and then kind of a, a little blurb uh, about the history of that site as well. Um, let's stick on COVID-19 here for a second because uh, 
businesses and organizations have had to change how they operate through this COVID-19 pandemic. While most of your work is through people coming in and potentially asking for that designation or being on the inventory or going out and looking for it, how has COVID-19 affected the day-to-day -day operations of Heritage Calgary, if it has and or if it hasn't? You know, I, I think the biggest change for us is, is really just focusing on our digital platforms. Um, you know, we, we've done a, a, a number of series on social media of different sites in, in Calgary. You know, we looked at sandstone schools. Um, we looked at, uh, you, know, un, you know, the unbuilt history of, of Calgary. You know, what were some of those projects that were bandied about over the years that, that never came to fruition? Um, we've done then and now photos of, you know, an old photo from the Glenbow and then gone and taken an updated photo. So now you, you can look kind of stack and see, you know, then and now photos. So it's really just been upping our, our, our digital platform. Um, we also undertook a, a blog series of, of the women of city council. Um, in an election year, you know, we, we, we were diving in um, to the number of women that have been elected. And, uh, you know, we started with Annie Gale and we've been working our way forward. And I think our next blog series is kind of looking at the 80s, 90s, 2000s and, and the 2010s and, and just how um, the history of women on city council has changed uh, in the last number of years. Um, you know, we, we, we sold off some heritage artifacts uh, last year to fund our plaque program. Um, we had some uh, elements from the old Queens Hotel, uh, which was demolished in the 1980s to make way for the municipal building. Um, and so we had a sign and, and some cornices uh, from that and then some bison heads from the 1980 um, renovation of the Center Street Bridge. And so I think we raised almost $75,000, $80,000 for that auction. And so we've been able to create a, a plaque endowment fund. Um, so any sites that are now designated as municipal heritage resources, we can give them a plaque um, to not to celebrate the fact that the site has been designated and also tell the history um, of those sites. You know, people, you know, whenever they go to London, they tell me about the little blue, you know, kind of plaques of, you know, who lived there. And, you know, plaques um, and, 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 and interpretations, um, that really is about placemaking and, and, you know, so for people to, you know, when they're moseying along uh, to learn more about Calgary, I think a really good example of that is called the Heritage Greenway on 13th Avenue Southwest, which it exists from kind of about uh, 5th Street all the way down to Center Street on 13th Avenue. The city has installed little, um, just little signs on plinths uh, that talk about, you know, um, what used to be there, like the fact that the original Smithville factory was located, I think, on 12th or 13th Avenue and 1st Street. Uh, it was uh, founded by, by a Jewish merchant, and so they have some history around that. Um, some of the old uh, hotels uh, that, that were there on 13th Avenue. So the whole idea of, of plaques um, and, and that sort of thing goes into placemaking. And so the fact that we were able to, to create uh, this endowment now that's held by the Calvary Foundation that will allow us to continue to have a lasting um, plaque program well into the future. You, this is a large undertaking. This uh, heritage is one of those things that can is always growing, always expanding, especially preserving the past. I, I, I wanna ask a sort of a pointed question and sort of a, on in your own opinion, what are some of the heritage sites that are unknown in this city that you would want people to know about? Because we, we all think about, like you said, the cauldron, we think about Olympic Park, but what are some of the unknown things that people really should go, you know what, if you have time during this pandemic, you want to just a nice outing, go here because it's a great spot to go to. Oh goodness! I mean, there there are the loaded so many... question for someone who is the literally the CEO of Heritage Calgary. But I I'm the host, and I get to ask the tough questions. Yeah, yeah, no, I I, I can understand that. You know, like I think there's you know like the, there's a site in in uh, Upper Mount Royal called the Anderson Residence, built in 1975, uh, in in the modern style of architecture, and it's actually designated as a municipal heritage resource. I think it's the newest. Uh, property that's designated as a municipal heritage resource, right? It was only built in 1975. 
And when it went to council, we had councillors being like, this is not heritage. Like, why are we designating this? And so we've, we've seen this understanding of heritage, I think, start to change and mature that heritage is not just 1912 Queen Anne revival. Um, heritage is really whatever we want to make it to be. And this house um, was designated by then uh, Gail Anderson, who uh, passed away a, a few years ago from cancer, unfortunately. But she was very involved in the art uh, sector in Calgary. She served on the Calgary Public Art Board for a number of years um, and was just very involved in, in, in our city. You know, you, you, you go and read, you know, the, the person value and it's the Anderson residence also has person value for its association with its first owner, Gail Anderson. Anderson is an important figure in Alberta's arts and culture scene, served on the public art board and spearheaded several public art initiatives in the city. And I think those are the kind of sites where, um, you know, like it's not the Lougheed building or it's not Lougheed house um, or anything like that. Another a really cool site that we just added to the inventory was the King residence in Hillhurst. And it was the home of Violet King, who was the first black woman to become a lawyer in Alberta. And her husband, or not her husband, her brother, uh, Theodore King, he was a pioneer when it came to rights for black porters, uh, you know, on, on the train and that sort of thing. And, and her family lived um, in Hillhurst Sunnyside, uh, I think in the 30s and even into the 40s. And that site, that house was brought to us by the attention of a community member in Hillhurst Sunnyside. She was doing research and came across reference to the King family and then, you know, started doing more research and realized that the first woman, uh, you know, the first black woman to become a lawyer in Alberta lived in this home and it still exists to this day. Um, those are the types of stories uh, that we're able to uncover through our work to build the inventory. Um, and that's why those sites are important. Um, you know, whether it's Gail Anderson because of her contribution to the arts in Alberta, or the fact that, um, you know, the, the, the King residence, um, you know, that, that, she, that she lived there and she was, you know, the first, the first black woman to become a lawyer in Alberta, which really was not that long ago. Like I think it was the 1950s that she was called to the bar um, those are the types of stories that, that, that the inventory tell us. I, I found a comment you just made very interesting that someone brought something to you and I, I, we're all living our own lives here in the, uh, in Calgary. We don't know what we're sitting on. Sometimes we may not know what the stories are that we need to tell, how does that make your job harder as the CEO and as of Heritage Calgary to try to preserve a history that people may not know they're sitting on? And I, I think that's one of the most challenging pieces because I think oftentimes um, we only care about something when it's gone. Um, you know, when, when that building has been demolished, when that construction fence is going up and, you know, we all know that that means that that building is probably on its way to the dump. Um, and I think it's really about shifting that mindset that heritage is community. And, you know, without the community of Calgary, we don't know what's out there. And we only know what we know. And we don't know what we don't know. And so, you know, we're always crowdsourcing, you know, for potential sites. And like, you know, we would never have added the King residence, the home to Violet King, to the inventory unless a member of the community brought it forward. Um, we would not likely uh, have evaluated the Ogden block, um, you know, which was slated to be demolished uh, as part of the Green Line, had members of the Ogden community and the Chinese community came forward and said, you know, this was a Chinese laundry. You know, this has significance to Calgary's Chinatown community. We wouldn't have known that if members of the community had not brought that to our attention. Um, I think that's one of the greatest parts about heritage and history in Calgary is we have such a dynamic community made up of community associations who maybe have um, a heritage um, committee. Um, you know, we have groups like the Calgary Heritage Initiative. We have groups like the Chinook Country Historical Society um, and lots of other groups that really are the backbone of, of when it comes to heritage in our city. And it's a, it's a small ecosystem, but I think it's been growing. I've been involved in heritage since 2010. Uh, so I guess 12 years now. And, and the interest that I've seen that Calgarians have had in heritage has just grown, you know, exponentially since 2010, where literally 
nobody cared, right? We were in boom time, you know, oil was $120 a barrel. You know, we saw, you know, there, there was never a day that it went by that you didn't see a, a house being demolished uh, because that idea that the land was worth more than, than the house, given that it was an inner, inner city neighborhood. And I think as we saw, you know, these boom and bust cycles, um, as much as bust is not great for our economy, it's, it's, it means that we see less um, heritage being demolished because there's, there's not really that demand um, for new buildings. And I think as this, um, our attitudes around um, climate change um, and greenhouse gases, this idea that the greenest building is the building that already exists, that heritage can start to play in to this conversation around um, climate change and climate resiliency and this whole conversation that people are, are really, um, you know, that, that, that's an important piece of, of our society moving forward. Calgary, Edmonton, Vegreville, St. Albert, Drumheller, Medicine Hat, Fort McMurray, and Peace River. These are some of the communities this show has been heard in. By advertising with us, your advert will be heard by countless Albertans and Canadians. Visit the link in the show notes to advertise with us today. I'm going to ask a very poignant question, and please, I do apologize if, if you're taken back by it. But why should people care? Why should people care about our heritage? Because let's be honest, we all live our lives and we all want to go about our business. Why should people actually care about what our heritage is? Our heritage tells us where we've come from, you know, from Indigenous peoples that have been here for millennia to, you know, the, the, the settlers that came to Calgary in the 1850s and 1880s. And we don't know what our history is. You know, we're, we're not we're not knowing where, where we're going to go. Um, you know, we've seen lessons from the 1918 pandemic to the current present day pandemic. You know, there was reports, you know, back in 1918 about, you know, wearing face coverings during the Spanish flu of 1980 that were in local Calgary Herald reports. And you, you, you just see the, the same conversations that, that keep happening, even around the new, set, uh, the new event center. This, the exact same debate was happening in the 1980s around the Olympic Coliseum of, you know, whether Victoria Park was the best place to build it. You know, what impact would it have on economic development in Victoria Park? And it's, you know, it kind of bears that question of, you know, we keep having the same conversations. Like, are we ever going to learn from our past? And I think sometimes we are. And I think sometimes we just, we just keep repeating the past. Um, you know, people often say, well, Calgary has no heritage. Well, we do, but we're also a very young city. Like, we're, you know, people say, oh, you know, I, I go to, I went to Europe and I, you know, was in a 500 year old pub and it's like, okay, well, if, if we ever want to have a 500 year old building in Calgary, we got to start with a hundred year old building, like hundred year old buildings don't grow overnight. It takes a hundred years to even get to that. And, and I think Calgary has often had this thought that, you know, uh, uh, new is better. Um, you know, we need to have, you know, the shiniest, the biggest, you know, and, 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 and that's it. And, and I think we're starting to see that mindset start to change, you know, this idea of, you know, reducing, reusing, recycling, you know, where the fact that if you call something vintage, you can, you know, put a three times markup on stuff. You know, I, I, you know, we're, you know, I have friends that, you know, want to live in mid-century modern houses because they think it's funky. You know, they don't want to live in the suburbs. They want to live, you know, in a 1912 home because, you know, they want to put in the sweat equity themselves or they like the character of that neighborhood. Um, I don't think that probably answered the question of like, you know, why should Calgarians care? But I think those are some of the reasons as to like why people should hair or sorry, care about heritage. Because I think there's, it's, there's so much more than, than just what meets the eye. I appreciate you answering it. And yes, you did answer the question. So I appreciate that. Um, I want to turn to, because I'm just cautious of time here. I'm just, I want to turn to a, uh, I'm not sure if it's a reoccurring program, but a new uh, venture that the uh, Heritage Calgary has kind of put for with in partnership with the Calgary Library. And that is, I want to make sure I get this, Historian in Residence. What does this mean and why is this important and where did this come from? Yeah, so, um, so back in 2012, when Calgary was the cultural capital of Canada, 
um, there was some inaugural funding put together to fund what was then called the Historian Laureate, kind of similar to the uh, Poet Laureate that's run by the city and Calgary Arts Development. And that first uh, Historian Laureate was Harry Sanders, a well-known Calgary historian, um, has written you know, many books uh, on Calgary's history, etc. And so when I joined the organization in 2015, it was kind of like, how can we have a similar program? And so, you know, we started looking, you know, is, is anyone else doing this? And we, we started talking to the library, you know, they had their, um, their writer in residence program. And we're like, you know, this, there, there seems to be some, some commonalities here. So we partnered on that, uh, I think back in 2019 was our inaugural year, um, and uh, and and we've had a it, it's a six five month paid residency um, that uh, that the historian does, and um, each historian has brought a, a, a different theme to their residency. Um, Kevin Allen, our inaugural historian residence, he was looking at Calgary's uh, LGBTQ plus history. Um, Kevin runs a, a well known blog called the Calgary Gay History Project. Uh, he wrote a book, um, you know, and and has really done some some phenomenal research uh, on Calgary's LGBTQ plus history. So he was our, our inaugural historian, and, and it went so well. We thought, let's let's make this a, a standing program. And so I think we're now on our there's Kevin, uh, Jesse Short, Sean Hunter. We're now on our fifth historian. Um, so um, applications are open until uh, mid February. And then uh, we'll be announcing our, our new historian in March. But you know, it's it's open to kind of any emerging historian. You know, we've seen themes from past applications. You know, like what did a uh, the bedroom of a 1980s 1990s teenager look like, and how has you know the bedroom changed over the years? You know, you know when you were a kid, you know you wanted your own phone. You know now you have you know your own your your own laptop, your own tablet. Um, you know everything like that. Um, just so many different themes. And, and I think that's the most exciting part about the historian, like uh, Corey Goss, our most, our most recent one, he was looking at Calgary's prehistory. So he was looking, you know, at the, the different, um, 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 uh, uh, like uh, sandstone groupings. Um, like he, uh, he was kind of looking at like the archeological side of things. Um, you know, like the Pascapoo sandstone and, and the different faults that Calgary finds it's on. He kind of mapped the different quarries uh, that were in the city of Calgary. Like most people may not know that in the heyday, we had about 20 quarries in and around the city of Calgary in kind of late, teen, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, but there's just, there's so many different themes. Like Sean Hunter, she was looking at Calgary's literary past. She built a uh, an interpretive map that, that can be found on our website of all the different literary points that have touched Calgary over over the last hundred plus years. You know, when different authors came through to do talks. Uh, you know, if if a Calgary writer lived somewhere, you know, W. O. Mitchell's house. Just kind of all the literary points. She's she's put them all into this really amazing map. What is the outcome that you look for in the historian and residence at the end of the year? Because you, you talked about the six that have currently or yeah. have been in the past, but this new one, we you're looking for one and uh, applications, yeah. like you said, are open until February 14th. What is the outcome? Is it is it always changing? Is it always evolving about what the outcome always, is? Yeah. And you leave it up to the potential historian really? residence? So each historian kind of comes to us and says, you know, this is the theme of, of what I want my residency to be. So we don't, you know, we don't say we're looking for this residency. It's all up to the historian. So they come, you know, they say, this is what I want to research during my residency. Uh, and then we, you know, uh, we have a selection committee that kind of works through it and they pick, you know, whatever is the most compelling uh, residency idea. And then that's, that's what the historian does for for their six months in residency. And what, where does the information go? So for the information of the past six residencies who were there, yeah. historians who were there, so it's, where is that information? So that, that's housed on our website and on the Calgary Public Library's website. Um, the, the Calgary Public Library has, uh, you know, Calgary Story, which was the old uh, local history room in the old uh, central library at the, at the Castell uh, Library. And so all of that is, is captured, uh, again, being in a digital age, you know, how, do you, how do you capture digital information, you know, knowing that you know, Google Map plug plugins might change in 15 years because maybe Google Maps are no longer a thing. So trying to think about how do we make sure that, that this information is able 
to not only transcend time, but also to remain relevant for, for future users. I mean, you know, we all have VHS tapes sitting at home that are no longer relevant. We all have CDs that are no longer relevant. So it's always trying to think, how can we continue to make this information not only accessible, but also relevant to future researchers, future historians, future Calgarians, you know, 10, 15 years, you know, down the road, which is not that long <laughs> down the road. Does it, it seems like 10 years ago, I was not thinking about where I was today and all the things that I was using 10 years ago was are completely outdated. So if, if, if I can still remember my password for MySpace, I'd be a happy camper, but I can't. So there we are. Um, yep. I, I want to turn to the future now. It's odd to talk to uh, someone in heritage and history about the future, but we always have to look towards the future because you can't always live in the past as much as you are living in the past being Heritage Calgary. What does 2022 have in store for Heritage Calgary and what are what things are on the plate? So we'll, we'll be delivering our, our naming, renaming and commemoration uh, handbook uh, to the city of Calgary um, sometime in, in the next few months. Um, and, and that handbook is really meant for, for, for all community groups, uh, you know, whether they're a big institution dealing with naming or renaming or they're a local community group, you know, trying to figure out how to name an unnamed green space uh, because they want to recognize someone in their community. Um, you know, continuing to support the city around heritage incentives uh, and tools to further heritage preservation in the city. Um, you know, looking at some, uh, some partnerships with our colleagues in Edmonton, the Edmonton Heritage Council, on continuing to advocate to, to the provincial government on, on continued support for heritage. Uh, we've seen provincial grants, uh, you know, decrease over the last 10 years uh, can, under multiple governments. Uh, we've seen uh, those grants continue to, 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 to decrease, uh, but we've seen the, the, uh, the need for them up uh, intake uh, it continued to, to increase. Um, and then also, you know, starting to prepare for the next, for the city's four-year budget, you know, figuring out what programs and services can we, uh, you know, look to offer Calgarians in the future so we can continue to remain relevant, you know, looking at, you know, maybe micro grants like a paint your porch program where we can give micro grants to, uh, to heritage properties uh, to give them a grant so that they can simply, you know, paint their porch uh, and do little things uh, like that. Uh, continue to build out our, our research uh, around heritage to, you know, show, you know, how, how heritage, um, you know, buildings help us, you know, are, are an economic driver. Um, you know, the, the, res the uh, restoration of historic city hall built a considerable amount of capacity when it comes to heritage trades in our city. Prior to that, we always had to look to Eastern Canada to find those trades where historic city hall uh, has trained um, tradespeople uh, on, you know, a sandstone restoration, window restoration, everything like that, to the point that there's been a few firms that have opened up shop in Calgary. So it's continuing to, to build on, on the success that Heritage has had in the last couple of years, but continuing to, you know, make that case to Calgarians that we need to continue to invest in Heritage, not only build Heritage, but also, you know, our, our cultural heritage, um, you know, supporting the Indigenous gathering um, place that council funded in the last in their last round of budget adjustments, and you know, seeing how how we can also support the uh, residential school um, survival memorial that was one of the calls to action under the White Goose Flying Report. So there's still lots of work to do when it comes to heritage, and and you know what, heritage Calgary really is just getting started. You know, this these last four years were the first time that we were funded as a civic partner. And, uh, you know, I, I think we've done some phenomenal work and, and we're going to continue to do that work. We're eager to, to work with this new mayor and council. And I think there's lots of lots of opportunities to, to continue to do some great work. Awesome. Josh, I have one last question for you before we wrap up, and that is how can people learn more? How can people yes. get involved? Because I think it, these are, I'm not sure if there's opportunities to volunteer, opportunities to get involved in Heritage Calgary, but how can people get involved and reach out and contact you know, the organization? Yeah. You know, best way is, is through our website, heritagecalgary.ca. We have lots of great information there from how to get on the inventory of how to designate. We have a bunch of, you know, useful links from, you know, the grant programs that are available to all of our partner organizations. Um, they can download our, our self-guided walking tours. They can sign up for our newsletter um, so that when we are able to have in-person events return, uh, people can, can take part in those. 
And that's the other thing we're looking at, you know, what are ways that we can create vol meaningful volunteer opportunities for, for Calgarians uh, to feel like, you know, they're, they're making an impact when it comes to heritage. Um, and then also, you know, follow us on our, on our, on our social media channels and, you know, and, and let their counselors know, you know, even if you live in, you know, suburban Calgary, you can still write your counselor and say, I care about heritage. Um, because, it, it, you know, heritage matters to every Calgarian. I want it to matter to every Calgarian. And we need to let, you know, our elected officials, our MLAs, our, and our counselors, and our MPs know that heritage matters. And, you know, we, we need to see increased supports uh, if we want to continue to see work like Heritage Calgary and other organizations are able to do. Um, Josh, I want to thank you so much for anyone who's listened and followed the show before, you know what I'm about to say, but I'll say it anyway, again, um, the links to all social media feeds for heritage Calgary show notes below, uh, website show notes below. Uh, if you're listening to this, follow, go back and hit the uh, main screen and you scroll down you can find all the information, Josh, it is a pleasure and honor. And I look forward to seeing what heritage Calgary has in 20 a store for 2022. I'm looking forward to potentially getting out and actually doing those walking tours last year and a half has kind of been on the rocks for me, but I'm looking forward to it because uh, I think history is kind of the important thing to remember and we need to get out and explore. So thank you so much for everything you do. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. For everyone here at the Crossboard Interviews with Chris Brown, and have yourself an excellent day. And remember, guys, keep talking. <laughs>